والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي now welcome all the viewers of the peace tv network the peace tv english peace tv urdu the peace tv bangla and the peace tv chinese as well as my social media platforms which are the facebook the youtube the instagram the twitter and the alida platform i welcome all the viewers with the same greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god be on all of you i welcome all of you to the program ask dr zakir season 9 session 3 here you are most welcome to ask any questions on islam and comparative religion or any question which a non muslim may have posed and you are unable to reply or any question that you find in the media which requires a reply this is your opportunity you can ask your question on any of the social media platforms but the best and the highest chance that will be answered is if you ask on the al hidayah platform as a subscriber and then followed by the whatsapp you can send your question as a text message briefly mentioning your name your profession the city and country from where you originate to the whatsapp number plus 60 Double one, two one, double three, double three, six zero. I repeat, plus six zero, double one, two one, double three, double three, six zero. We'll take the first question. The first question is from the Alida platform, from Mukti Das. He is a farmer from Murshidabad, India. Dear sir, I am a Hindu. I am ready to accept Islam if you answer this question of mine. My question is regarding future prediction in the Quran. Number one, when Twin Tower, 9/11. will be destroyed the time was mentioned the date month and the year this is mentioned in surah tauba verse number 109 and 110 the date is surah tauba 9 month is juz number 11 of surah tauba and the year is total words from starting surah tauba to ayah number 108 second when man first landed on the moon This is mentioned in Surah Al Qamar. We know that man landed in the moon in 1969, and the Arabic date is 1389 Hijri. From Surah Nas to Qamar, total verse is 1389, and the numerical value of the first verse of Surah Qamar is 1389. What is your opinion for this? Can you increase the? I cannot get the the AC, please. <clears throat> But the Mukti Das asked the question regarding that if I answer this question, he would love to accept Islam and is interested in the future prediction of the Quran. And he says that he came to know that it was mentioned in the Quran regarding the time and the date of the 9/11, that the twin tower bombing. and he says that this is mentioned in surah tauba chapter number 9 verse number 109 110 and surah tauba is chapter number 9 so it is 9 and it is juz 11 of the quran so it is 11 9 11 that is september 11th and if you count the total number of uh words coming from the starting of surah tauba to verse number 108 it comes to the year and he gives us an example that it was said in the quran in surah qamar that the date of man landing on the moon it is 1969 and hijri is 1389 so if you count the 
number of words from Surah Nas to Surah Kamar, it is 1389, which is Hijriya. So what are my comments? As far as both these examples are concerned, there is no tafsir of the Quran or classical tafsir which ever speaks about these things. This is just according to me a concoction that some Muslim may have tried to show some prediction and he tried to match and he came up with the theory that this destruction is mentioned in Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 109. And if you read Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse 109, it says that which would you prefer? Which is better of the two? Laying your foundation on the piety to Allah and his pleasure or laying the foundation on the sand cliffs which breaks down to pieces and it will surely break down to pieces and it will be in hell. So based on this, when the verse talks about breaking down to pieces, someone came up uh, with the hypothesis that, you know, the destruction of the Twin Tower and this is predicted in the Quran. This is totally wrong because if you read the two verses before of Surah Tawbah chapter number 9, verse number 107, it says that if the foundation is laid on fitna, talking about, about the munafiks who make a mosque, if the foundation of the mosque is based on fitna creating among the believer, it's not good. And the next verse speaks about the best is foundation in taqwa. If you keep, if you build the foundation of the mosque on taqwa, and you'll find that this is the mosque that you should pray in. And then verse number 109 says that which is better of the two? To lay a foundation on the piety to Allah or seeking his pleasure or making a foundation on the sand cliffs and it breaks down to pieces and it continues saying the sand cliff breaks down to pieces and it will be in the fire of hell. So this is talking about the, that if the mosque is made by monafics or made with the intention to disunite the believers, then this mosque is not correct. And talks about the incidents, how the Munafik had made a mosque during the time of the Prophet. And then it goes to the next verse that the mosque, the main foundation should be on Taqwa and people will pray more on it. And then it talks about verse 109 that the best is that the foundation should be on the piety of Allah, seeking his pleasure, not on foundation, on sand cliffs which will break down to pieces. No tafsir talks about 9-11 is going to happen. So there are some Muslim who out of enthusiasm try and match and think which is totally wrong. We should not go into this type of hypothesis. If this is true, then the few verses before that, it talks about uh, having a war uh, with the pagans of Makkah. Is the date matching? That's also the Tawbah, that is 9. And that also is Jews Levit. And how come the Quran which follows the lunar calendar is giving the date of the solar calendar? So these are just hypotheses and this is not what uh, should be followed. What we should follow is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran and the classical tafsir of the Quran. These are just hypotheses made by some Muslim to try and prove that these are miracles of the Quran. This does more harm to the spread of Islam than good. And even the second about that man landed on the moon in 1969, the Hijri was 1389 and if you count the number of words, it is the same. These are this hypothesis which doesn't carry any weight. You can, if you agree with this set of calculation, yes, one may match, but there will be 99 which do not match. What about the other verses of the Quran talking about other events? Did it happen on the 9th level? No, it didn't happen. So, if someone wants to argue, if you use this logic to the other verses of the Quran on the events, it will not show any date. But really, brother, my brother Mukti Das, who really want to know about the future prediction, there are many. And I've given a talk on, is the Quran God's word? We speak about this in detail. There are various predictions. For example, if you read Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 1, verse number one to verse number six. It talks about Alif, Lam, Meem. 
Romans, they will be defeated in a nearby land. And after they're defeated, they'll be victorious after a few years. And the believers will rejoice. And when this verse was revealed, the Persians, they had defeated the Byzantine Empire of the Romans. And the Mushrikeen of Makkah, they were very happy because the Romans, they were believers in God. And now the fire worshippers, the Persians, they come and defeat the Romans. So the Mushrikeen of Makkah was very happy. They were very happy. And the believers, the Mormon, the Muslims, they were sad. So the verse was revealed that the Romans have been defeated in a nearby land. And the verse continues. They, defeat, they are defeated, but they'll be victorious in a few years. And in Arabic, it means less than 10 years, a few years. And we know that the Persians, they defeated the Byzantine Empire in 615 CE. But within next nine years, who would think that the Roman Empire, which was defeated, they, in the span of nine years, they defeat the Persians again in 624 CE. So this was a prophecy. And this prophecy, this prediction, was revealed when the Romans were defeated and the Quran was there. And while the Quran was being revealed, while the prophet was there, this prediction comes true. So these are things which are historical facts, which can be verified. And the Quran is very clear cut on this. And there are various such predictions. For example, if you read Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 29, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills the vision, the dream of the messenger. Talking about the dream, the vision of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And the messenger will enter with security and safety the sacred mosque, that's Makkah, with his head shaved and his hair cut short and without any fear. You don't know, but Allah knows. So Allah is predicting that the vision and the dream of Prophet Muhammad that he will go back to Makkah, will be fulfilled. He'll enter Makkah, the sacred mosque, with safety, with security, with his head shave, that is performing the Umrah of the Hajj, and with his hair cut, and without any fear. And we know that later on, towards the towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, we know about the Fatih Makkah, that the Prophet went, mashallah, and that was a bloodless victory, alhamdulillah. This is a future prediction. Similarly, the Quran speaks in Surah Nasr, that is chapter 110, where Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ that when comes the help of Allah, there will be victory. And you will find large number of people of other religions entering the fold of Islam in large crowds. So, praise the Lord and ask for forgiveness, for he is often of returning. So this again is a prediction that large number of people will enter into Islam and the Prophet, mashallah, goes back to Makkah and you find that many people accept Islam. There were, when he gave the favorite pilgrimage, the 124,000 sahabas, alhamdulillah. This is a prediction. Further, if you read Surah Lahab, that is chapter number 111, which says, talking about Abu Lahab, that is the father of the flame. And we know that Abu Lahab was one of the staunchest enemy of the Prophet. And whenever the Prophet spoke to anyone, the moment the Prophet went away, he used to go to the person and say, what did the Prophet say? Black, it is white. Did the Prophet say day? It is night. He used to speak exactly opposite of what the Prophet used to say. And he used to lie very often. Here this verse and this surah is revealed. In this surah, it says that indicates that Abu Lahab will never accept Islam and he will die in the hellfire. And after this verse was revealed, Abu Lahab lived for several years. If he said so much of lie against the Prophet, he could have lied one more time to prove the Quran wrong. He could have said, I'm a Muslim. Not that he had to believe, 
Even if you don't realize that you are the Muslim, the Quran has been proved wrong. So imagine the author of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is telling that Abu Lahab will never accept Islam. A person who was the staunchest enemy, who was a liar, only thing he had to do was lie once more, and the Quran would have been proved wrong. Only thing he had to do was say that I'm a Muslim, not that he had to pray, not that he had to behave like one. Only he could have said, I'm a Muslim, and the Quran would have been proved wrong. But he never did it. And we know that he died, and we know that Allah put him in the hellfire. So this is a prediction. There are very such predictions. So if you really want to know about the future predictions in the Quran, I would request you to see watch my video cassette on the topic is the Quran God's word. The talk is for approximately one and a half hour to one hour forty five minutes for the question and session, both put together about three and a half hours. And I've said that the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And the Quran to prove itself the word of God, any book to prove that it is the word of God, it should pass the test of time. Previously was the age of miracles and the Quran is the miracle of miracles. Then came the age of literature and poetry. And you know that Arab, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they acclaim the glorious Quran to, the best, to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today is not the age of literature and poetry. Suppose a book in a very poetic fashion says the world is flat. Will a modern man believe today? And the answer is no. Because today is the age of science and technology. So if you put the Quran to the test of science and technology, you will come to know that the Quran has more than 6,000 verses, out of which more than 1,000 verses speak about science. And I've given various detail. The, the Quran speaks about biology, it speaks about physiology, it speaks about oceanology, it speaks about zoology, it speaks about embryology, about medicine, and all the details. This will surely prove to you that this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And including, there are many predictions. There are many falsification tests. I would request you to watch my video. And since you are a subscriber on the Alidaya platform, you can very well go to the video on demand section and type, is the Quran God's word? And you can watch that tape. And inshallah, inshallah you'll be convinced. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you hidayah so that you accept Islam. And inshallah, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that after you give you hidayah, that he shall put you in Jannah the Firdaus, inshallah. Jazakallah shaykh. The next question from Abdul Rafi. A student from Sydney, Australia. Assalamu alaikum, Zakir Naik. I wanted to ask that if a person realizes that some of the products which he sells are haram, so he stops buying more but still has some stock left, then what does he do with that remaining stock? Can he st still sell it? And would the money be halal or should he throw them all out? But Abdul Rafi has asked a question that if someone is selling some products and he realizes that some of the products he's selling is haram, so should he stop it immediately? And if he has some in stock, can he sell that? And then in future, he will not order more and he will not sell more. But can he sell the stock which is remaining? Is the money earned from that halal or not? If suppose a Muslim out of ignorance in selling some product which is haram, he may be selling some cake containing alcohol and he may not be aware of it. He may, be selling, he may be selling some drinks thinking it's a soft drink and it turns out to be an alcoholic drink. If he does this in ignorance, inshallah, Allah will forgive him. But the moment he realizes that the product he's selling is haram, he should stop selling it immediately. If he realizes it, he cannot say that I've got some stock and that will take maybe two weeks for me to sell and I will not buy new stock. What if the moment he comes to know the product he's selling is haram, he cannot sell a single piece of that. If he realizes that the drink he's selling contains alcohol, 
he cannot he cannot sell even one bottle after that what should he do should he throw it what he can do he can give it back to the supplier and tell him that i did not know that this contained alcohol or you know it's haram i'm a muslim i cannot sell take it back if he doesn't give you the full amount of what you purchased that okay if you purchase for 100 dollars okay suppose you purchase it for maybe 10 dollars okay take it back for 9 dollars take it back for 8 dollars give me 10% less give me 20% less give me 40% less but if he doesn't take it back at all very well you cannot sell it you may lose some money but inshallah you will get some up for that because our beloved prophet peace be upon him clearly said that as far as alcohol is concerned all 10 categories of people are cursed and all the categories are given including the person who sells it and the person who buys it and the person who drinks it so if you are selling any good which is halal out of ignorance if you do it allah will forgive you but the moment you come to know it is haram product you cannot sell a single piece you cannot say that i'll finish my stock it's haram you can give it back to the supplier if you can if he doesn't take it if you even if you have to throw it that's accepted and you may go in loss for that product but inshallah in the long run it will benefit you in this world as well as the akhirah hope that answers the question The next question from Manaj Das, a student from Murshidabad, India. Dear sir, I am a non-Muslim Hindu. I want to know about the Pharaoh and Dr. Morris Bukil story. Please tell me. I am very excited to know it. Brother Manaj Das from Murshidabad, he asked the question on the Alida platform that you would like to know the story of Dr. Maurice Bukel and, and the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh. Maybe you may have seen my talk on Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding. And in that talk, I did mention about the incidents of the Pharaoh and Dr. Maurice Bukel. Dr. Maurice Bukel was a very famous scientist who had got the French Academy Award in the field of medicine. He was selected to treat the mummy of Manatta. The mummy of Manatta is the pharaoh which is mentioned in the Bible in the book of Exodus. And when the mummy of that pharaoh was found, he was selected to treat or do research on it. So when he does his research and treats and he he being a Christian, he knew the background that the Bible says that Moses, peace be upon him, along with the children of Israel, he goes away from Pharaoh's land and then later on Pharaoh chases him and Moses, peace be upon him, he parts the sea and when they, when they cross the sea, Pharaoh follows and when Pharaoh follows and when Moses and the children of Israel when they cross and when Pharaoh is in the midway the sea again collapses and the complete army of Pharaoh, Pharaoh drowns and even Pharaoh drowns. He being a Christian he knew this background but when Dr. Morris Bukel goes to Saudi Arabia one of the Muslims told him that what you have now the mummy of Manapta of Pharaoh it is nothing new for us because that is also mentioned in the Quran Quran mentions in Surah Yunus chapter number 10 verse number 92 that we shall preserve the body of Pharaoh of Pharaoh as a sign for posterity so Dr. Morris Bukhil was shocked that and he read the Quran and he found that the Quran also talks about the same incidents but the Quran goes a step further and says that Allah says in the Quran in Surah Yunus chapter number 10 verse number 92 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty God will save the body of Pharaoh of Pharaoh as a sign for posterity. So who could have predicted 
that the body of the pharaoh would be saved as a mummy. So this made Dr. Morris Bukel read the translation of the Quran. After reading the translation, he was so impressed that he wanted to learn Arabic to understand the Quran better. Well, if you know original Arabic Logha Fosa, you can understand the Quran better. So Dr. Morris Bukel, at the age of 50, he learns Arabic as a language. And he finds out that there are hundreds of verses in the Quran which talk about science and they match with scientific facts and he could not find a single verse of the Quran which is against scientific facts unlike the Bible he being a Christian he knows that there were many verses of the Bible which contradict with science so much so that later on after doing research after learning Arabic he writes a book by the name the Bible the Quran and science and that book became very famous and he proved there that this Quran has to be from God and Alhamdulillah though he accepted Islam he did not make it public but we know uh, through other sources through his other Muslim friends that he had accepted Islam he used to pray regularly five times but he did not reveal maybe he thought that keeping it a secret he'll be able to do more benefit for Islam than saying it so this was an incident I related in my talk, Al-Quran, should it be of the understanding, showing the importance of learning Arabic as a language. So hope this incident inspires you, Brother Das. The next question is again from Alida platform, from Omar, EMT, paramedic trainee from Hamburg, Germany. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have got a painting as a present and do not know, and I do not know if I could hang it up. It is from a Turkish museum and has non-Quranic calligraphy on it. Also, it contains a small painted flower with real gold on it. The texture of the painting is rough. Please clarify. Jazakallah khairan. The question posed by the Omar is that he got a present, which is a painting, which is non-calligraphy Quran. And it contains flower, it has gold, it has texture. Is it permitted to hang? And I've given this answer in detail that you cannot hang pictures or photos of animate living things. The, the living beings from the animal kingdom, whether it be the animals, the birds, or the human beings, these pictures and photos you cannot put on the wall. But if it's of the scenery, if it's of the mountains, of the trees, of the flowers, there's no objection at all. Since you're painting has got flowers, it's perfectly fine. And the calligraphy is non-Quranic calligraphy. Some people want to put Quranic verses and according to scholars, hanging Quranic verses on the wall is uh, not correct. The Quran wasn't revealed for that. The Quran was revealed to be recited and implemented. So since it's a non-Quranic calligraphy, it contains flower, it is perfectly fine if you want to hang it on the wall of your home, of your office, it is permitted. And uh, you can do it. Next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Zainal Abidin, a businessman from Selangor, Malaysia. Azar Idrus, a famous speaker and Dai from Malaysia, said that it is not permitted for Muslims to clean the temples of the Hindus after the floods. The media and most of the Muslims criticized and disagreed with him. Can Muslims help the Hindus in cleaning the temples after the flood? What is the Islamic ruling? <clears throat> Uh, 
regarding the Islamic ruling of helping anyone, the reply is given in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 2, where Allah says, that help one another in righteousness and good work. But do not help one another in sin and transgression. So this is the guideline that Allah gives in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 2 that help one another in piety in righteousness and good works but do not help one another in sin and transgression so this is the golden rule as far as helping one another is concerned and there is no problem at all Muslims can very well help the other Muslims they can help the non-Muslims they can help the Hindus they can help the Chinese they can help the Christian there is no restriction at all but the golden rule is help one another in good works but do not help one another in sin and transgression. This is the golden rule. And we know that recently, in the last couple of weeks, there was heavy rains over here in this country, Malaysia, and many parts of Malaysia that floods and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may help the victims of the flood and may he ease the problems that was created by the flood and may he see to it that the difficulties of the Malaysian in the respective the Muslims, the non-Muslims, whether it be Hindus, Chinese, or Malay, may, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help these victims and give them peace and tranquility soon. As far as helping is concerned, during the floods, we know that some of the people died. There were about 48 people that died according to the records. Now, if you go out in a boat to save someone, if, and if you find a Muslim, you save him. If you find a Hindu, also you save him. If you find a Chinese, you have to save him too. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse, verse number 32, that if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder, or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though we have killed the whole of humanity. And the verse continues. And if anyone saves any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. So the golden rule of the Quran, which is not there in any other religious scripture, I am a student of compiled religion, no religious scripture says that if you save any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of nation. So imagine if there is a Hindu who is drowning, and if you go out in a boat and you save him, it, here the Quran says, it is as though you have saved the whole of nation, irrespective of whether you are the Muslim or non-Muslim. You have to save as many people as you can. And after the floods have subsided, you want to help the people who are the victims of the flood, go and clean their homes, no problem. You can help cleaning the houses of the Muslims, of the Malay, of the Hindus, of the Chinese, of the Christians. It is good, alhamdulillah, because Quran says, help one another in good work. So if you go to clean a non-Muslim's house, whether it be Hindu, whether it be a Christian, whether it be a Chinese, it is good. You will get some up for that. Suppose in the floods, there was some furniture destroyed. And if you donate charity to the Muslim to buy new furniture, or to the Hindu to buy new furniture, or the Christian, or the Chinese, you will get some up for that. You can give them money to buy furniture or maybe their fridge has got spoiled. So this is good. And we know that in Bombay, where we had an organization, where I lived before, we had a big organization and we knew that there were riots in Bombay. That was in 1993. So when we went to get relief activity, but naturally since the riots took place mainly in the Muslim majority area, we went there and we gave relief. And in that area, there were some houses of Hindus. Of course, we saw to it that we helped him in those houses. We gave them utensils, we gave them the relief package. This is Islam. In Bombay, we had an organization where we had a free medical center in an area which was poor. But naturally, because it was mainly a Muslim-dominated area, most of the patients coming were Muslims. But there were even non-Muslim patients coming. There were Hindu patients coming. There were Christian patients coming. We used to give free treatment. We never said that 
you are a Hindu, we cannot treat you. We should give free, as long as they were poor people and they required help. So this is what Islam teaches, that be kind, be merciful to all the human beings, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. But you have to follow the golden rule that help one another in good works. But do not help one another in sin and transgression or anger. So in floods, if a Muslim goes and helps other Muslims, it's good. If a Muslim goes and helps the other non-Muslim, he will surely get some up. Whether it be a Hindu, whether it be a Christian, whether it be a Chinese. But I like to ask you a question. Suppose there's a poor man who's affected by flood. And he comes and asks you, I'm affected by flood. Please, can you give me some money? I want to drink alcohol. You as a Muslim, will you give him money to have alcohol? And the answer is no. If he says I want for some medicine, surely you will give. If he says I want for some treatment, you will give. But if he says he wants for money for having drug, maybe cocaine, maybe brown sugar, will you help him? And the answer is no. Why? Because we know that having alcohol is the 19th major sin in Islam. You cannot help one another in sin and transgression. So I as a Muslim, maybe there is a Muslim who is alcoholic. Even if a Muslim comes to me and he asks me, that brother Dakir, can you give me about 100 ringgit? I want to have a bottle of wine or alcohol. I will not give. I say, I'll give you 1000 ringgit. You can buy medicine for your treatment. But I cannot give you 100 ringgit to buy a bottle of alcohol. Why? Because it's against the golden rule of the Quran that do not help one another in sin and transgression. We have to help other, each other, but in things which are good and in righteousness. Let me give you an example. That if you are cleaning after the floods, cleaning houses and helping the victims is very good. You can go and help the Muslim who house have been completely destroyed in flood or it may be a non-Muslim, maybe a Hindu, maybe a Christian, maybe a Chinese. No problem, it will give you sawa. But imagine if there is a gambling den which is submerged in flood and after the water subsides and if someone comes and tells me let's go and clean the gambling den, I will not go. Why? Because gambling is the 20th major sin in Islam. I cannot go and help in cleaning the gambling den because it goes against the golden rule of the Quran of Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 20 which says help one another in good deeds and righteousness but do not help one another in sin and transgression there may be other non-muslims who may feel gambling is good they may be making money so if other non-muslims for whom gambling is not a sin if they go and help cleaning the gambling then that is their option but I as a Muslim I cannot go and clean a gambling den after floods. Let me give you an example. That if suppose while I'm going to help the people who are affected with floods and I go to a Muslim area and while helping I realize that this house belongs to a terrorist. Yet as a human being I will help him. Suppose the terrorist comes to me as a medical doctor. I as a medical doctor, I have to save his life, even though he's a terrorist, because my work is to save the life. Now, while cleaning the house, he tells me, I have got a rifle. I have got a machine gun. And in the floods, this machine gun got spoiled. Will you help me clean it? And I know, what does he do with his machine gun? He's killing innocent people. So how can I help him to clean a machine gun which is destroyed in floods? If I clean, what will he do? He will kill more innocent people. So is a Muslim allowed to clean a machine gun of a terrorist? And the answer is no. Where does it say? Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 2. They do not help one another in sin and transgression. Killing innocent human being is the second major sin in Islam. It is worse than cleaning a gambling den. Cleaning a gambling den, gambling is the 20th major sin in Islam. But cleaning a machine gun of a terrorist which kills other human beings, it 
It is prohibited. On the other hand, if I, even though he may be a Muslim or non-Muslim, I cannot. On the other hand, if I go to another house and he turns out to be an army officer and he tells me to clean his gun, I will clean his gun because he is an army officer. He is taking care of the country. So cleaning the gun of an army officer is permitted because he is not doing anything haram. But cleaning a gun or a machine gun or a rifle of a terrorist is wrong. So you should understand that helping one another is good. But see to it that it should not go against the teachings of the Quran. Coming to your main question. <clears throat> that a famous Dai and a speak of Malaysia, Ustaz Azari Drus, when a person asked him this question a few days back, that can Muslims clean the temples of the Hindu because there was an article that came that some Muslim students from the IIUM Islamic International University they cleaned the temple and he said this is not permitted in Islam and there were big backs there was many people who criticized uh, Ustaz Azari Drus and they disagreed with him so what is my opinion <clears throat> I have met Ustaz in Azari Drus and Alhamdulillah according to me he is a knowledgeable person he is a very famous guy and his reply to this question that can Muslim clean the places of house of worship in which shirk is done is it allowed or not is correct I would like to ask the Muslim that is shirk permitted in Islam and the answer is no is idol worship allowed in Islam? And the answer is no. It is the number one sin in Islam. So can you help in cleaning the pace where idol worship is done? And the answer is no. So anyone who knows the basic rule of Sharia and Ustaz Azhar, MashaAllah, he is a knowledgeable person. He has knowledge of the Sharia. But the other Muslims may not be aware of the ruling of the Sharia. So but natural what Ustaz Azhar Idru said, I completely agree with him. Maybe in the newspaper they might have only told this one sentence and may not have given the logical reasoning, like I have given the reasoning, logical reasoning. Even he may have given. Maybe the newspapers attacked him and they did not give his full answer. So we can help Hindus and Muslim in good work. Give them charity, give them money for education, give them money for treatment, give them money to buy furniture, no problem. We should help. But the question is, can you help in cleaning of a Hindu temple where idol worship is done? And the answer is no. That doesn't mean that I am enemies of the Hindu, not at all. It is my belief. I believe and it's a major sin in Islam. And every Muslim believes. If any Muslim who has the basic knowledge of Sharia, he knows that idol worship is haram. So based on this verse of the Quran, can I help other people in doing idol worship? And the answer is no. He is doing it fine. I can tell him not to do it. If he continues, I will not fight with him. But I cannot help him. So his answer was like, for example, if I slaughtered a goat during Eid al-Adha and during Eid al-Adha my, and my neighbor is a Hindu, he is a Hindu who is a pure vegetarian because Hindus of two types, some are non-veg, some are vegetarian. Now this neighbor of mine, he is a pure vegetarian Hindu I, and if I slaughter a goat during Eid al-Adha, I will not expect him to help me clean the blood of that goat. Oh, he is a person who believes that eating non-veg is haram. I respect his view. I will not tell him, why don't you come and help your neighbor, come and help me clean the goat and I want to then I slaughter the goat and I hang the goat and I tell him, help me to clean and take out the, the, the skin of the goat. He cannot do it. He will puke. Because he believes eating non is haram. According to his religion, he has a right. It will be illogical for me to tell that Hindu neighbor who is a vegetarian that in Eidul Adha help me to clean the goat or after I slaughter the goat, I will ask him to come and help me clean the blood. It will be nonsense and I should not feel bad. Similarly, I don't expect a Hindu who is a vegetarian to come and wish me happy Eid al-Adha. 
if he believes eating non-veg is not correct, that's his belief. I may disagree with his belief. I'll not fight with him. I will not tell him, I will not force him to come and wish me happy Idul Adha. It's nonsense. He has a right to his belief. Therefore, I have a right to believe. So I will help the non-Muslim in the flood, but I will not help clean up a gambling den, which is the 20th major sin in Islam. I will not help a person to drink alcohol, which is the 19th major sin in Islam. I will not help a terrorist to clean his weapon, because that weapon takes innocent life, which is the second major sin in Islam. Similarly, I will not help in cleaning the places of worship where idols are worshipped. And people, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, other false gods are worshipped. I cannot. Why should a person make a big uproar about it? This is mainly done by the media. And they're asking him that, did, did Ustaz, other Idrus help people in the flood? And they ask me also, I mean, we're not doing it for you to show. I mean, there's a record you can see in my institution you will never find the Indian government telling that Dr. Zakir Naik has helped the non-Muslim, never. They cannot find any evidence against That's the reason, mashallah, the majority of the Hindus in India love me. Now, when they found that the majority of the Hindus love me, they had to create something so that they create animosity between me and the non-Muslims. This is done by the Hindu politicians of India. And what we find that in India, mashallah, the majority of the Hindus love me. But I held my principles. I, and I know, and they know that I love my principles. You know, I lived in an area where there were Hindus around me. And during Ganesh Chaturthi, they used to come to collect donation. Now, when they came to me, I used to tell them, this is against my religion. They said, okay, at least give me 500 rupees. I said, 500 rupees, I will give you 5,000 rupees. But I cannot give you for the Ganesh Chaturthi, because they disagree. I will give you 5,000 rupees for the education of your child. And that's what I did. I said, if you want money for treating your children or someone who's sick in your family, I will help, even if you're Hindu. Not 500, I'll give you 5,000, I will give you 10 times more. And they were very happy. They respected my view. But if someone wants to criticize me, oh, Dr. Zakir Naik said that you cannot give donation for Ganesh Chaturthi. Yes, I believe in that. But they will not say that Dr. Zakir Naik gave 10 times more than what they asked for helping in education. We used to give scholarship. We used to give scholarship even to non-Muslims. And we have helped the education institutions on Muslims also. Here the flush took place in Malaysia. Alhamdulillah, I helped the victims. I helped Muslims who were Malay. I helped the Chinese. I helped the Christian, I even helped the Hindus. Not one, quite a few. Now, I'm not here to show to the press. I'm doing it because it's the duty of a Muslim to help any other human. But the help I gave was for the flood, for the thing which will help them to buy the furniture. Maybe help them to repair the goods which have been spoiled in the flood. I've done that. But if the press is against me, the headline, Dr. Zakir Naik says you Muslims cannot clean the Hindu temple. That's it. They will not say that Dr. Zakir Naik helped several Hindus who were victims of flood. They will not say that. Why? Because they want to malign me. The headline should be Dr. Zakir Naik helped the Hindus in Malaysia who were affected by flood. They will not say that. They will purposely want to malign me. And if they give my full answer, I have got no problem. If they give the full answer, the Dr. Zakir Naik said, if you help and if you save the life of a Hindu, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity, no problem. Help the Hindus in education, no problem. Help the Hindus if they are sick, no problem. Help them in floods and clean their homes. But do not help in cleaning gambling dens. Do not help in non-Muslims to drink alcohol, do not help in cleaning the places of worship of the non-Muslim. Okay. Give the full answer, no problem. But only selectively taking an answer. So this is mainly done by the media which is against Islam. So my request to the Muslim brothers and my non-Muslim brothers is that please don't go on the media. That's what they did. They take you out of context and they try and 
will malign you and say, oh, doctor, Zakir Naik is against the Christian, Zakir Naik is against the Hindus, Zakir Naik is against the Chinese. Where? I mean, most of the non-Muslims love me. But when this media picks up and quotes out of context and takes only one thing, and then they want to portray that this person is against the non-Muslim. Where? So, Alhamdulillah, Islam teaches humanity. Love your human brothers. And that's what Islam teaches. But at the same time, when it says that help one another in righteousness and good deeds, it also says do not help one another in sin and transgression. So anything which is against my religious belief. And why should the non-Muslim feel bad? Why should they interfere? That is my belief. That is the belief of a Muslim. Now if out of ignorance, if some Muslim students of a university clean the place of worship of a temple out of ignorance, inshallah Allah will forgive them. They may not be aware of this verse of the Quran that do not help one another in sin and transgression. Or every Muslim doesn't know the full Quran by heart. So if they did it out for ignorance, inshallah I'll forgive them. But if they know, in future they'll be careful. So what Ustaz Azhar Idrus was doing was educating the Muslims. And you see among the classical fatwas of all the classical scholars. This is very common. That you can help one another righteous work. But you can, no, no scholar will say that you, that you help the other person having alcohol. Or no scholar will say that you can help in cleaning the gambling den. No scholar will say that. So what we have to realize is that we have to be careful of the media. The media normally picks up part of it. They misquote it. They quote out of context and they want to malign the duats and the Muslim preachers. And, uh, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that, uh, that may he give to Ustaz Azar Idrus the best of this world as well as the Akhirah. The next question from Abdul Rafi, a student from Sydney, Australia, again from the Alida platform. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam. Due to the pandemic, my local mosque is conducting two Friday prayers with two different imams. After the first Duma is done, the next batch of people enter the mosque to pray. Uh, the next batch of people enter the mosque to pray the second jama. I have heard from some sheikhs that it is not permissible to conduct multiple Friday prayers in one mosque. Can you please verify if this is true? Jazakallah khairan. But Abdul Rafi has asked a question that due to the pandemic uh, in Sydney, in Australia where he lives, they have two Jamaats in one mosque, they have uh, two Juma Salahs in one mosque. Is it permissible? Some Sheikh says it is not allowed. Under normal circumstances, as far as having a second Jama in them, as far as having a second Juma Salah in the same mosque, the ruling is that normally for Juma, the ruling is that in every locality there should be one big Juma mosque. It's called a Jame mosque or Juma mosque. And the reason is that normally a Muslim should pray five times in the mosque, the main. It's compulsory. But during Juma, it should be a bigger congregation. So the normal mosques normally don't have the Salah. They don't have the Zohar Salah or the Juma Salah during five days. But what they do? that everyone gathers in one mosque in a locality, a bigger mosque, so that the gathering is bigger. And for Eid, the gathering is much bigger, they play in open ground. So the logic of a Juma mosque is a bigger mosque, so that the Muslims of that locality are united. But now, in cities and in places where there is lack of space and it's difficult to have very big mosques, so there are Juma in not one mosque, but many mosques in the locality. And this, 
the scholars have permitted because there may not be enough space of having all in one particular mosque because you've got a bigger mosque and that mosque will only be used for mainly Juma for the other time it will be less used. <clears throat> so in such situation where there is lack of space and there is not a big mosque and a Juma is prayed in multiple mosques that is permitted. But if there is one big mosque and all the Muslims of that area can be accommodated in one mosque then having a second mosque is not advisable. This is the ruling. Now coming to your question that under normal circumstances can we have two Juma in the same mosque. In this the scholars are divided. The scholars say that in normal circumstances never in the history of Islam before at the time of the Prophet or at the time of Sabah were was there ever two Jumas prayed in the same mosque like one Juma then after one or the second Juma with the new Khatib with the second Khatib with the second Imam it was never done so it is not permitted. Some scholars are reluctant to okay, because of the lack of space, like how we do permit more than one Juma mosque in that area, we, we can have if it's a very busy city and if the space is <coughs> less and if you can't find anywhere else. But the first group of scholars says no, if there's no space you can go out in the open, you can pray in the garden, you can pray in the public area which is legal to pray, do that. So one group of scholars says, no, you cannot have two Juma in the same mosque. Other group of scholars says it is not advisable, but in circumstances where there is lack of space, you can have the difference of opinion. Now coming to your question in pandemic, in pandemic can we have two Juma Salahs? Now in this pandemic, since the last nearly two years, or one year, ten months, we know that this COVID-19 was first detected in the end of December 2019, exactly two years from now, but it spread in different parts of the world, mainly in March 2020, that is one year, 10 months from now. And we know that things have changed completely since then. And if you had asked me that, can you pray Salah in a Jamaat with keeping a difference of two meters and one meter, then I've given the answer that never ever it happened in the history of Islam before. But yet there are fatwas of scholars that are saying that because of the pandemic to prevent the infection you can have a gap of two meters or one meter between between the musalli and it's permitted yet there are some scholars who say no it's not permitted when you're going in the marketplace etc fine you touch your feet we you don't as long as you you are close to each other, touch your feet, the gap should not be there. The difference of opinion is there. Now similarly coming to this question, that can you have two Juma in the same mosque? Normally, the more authentic ruling is that you should not have. It is better because it was not there in the past. Even I agree with those scholars who say that even in pandemic, I say that there should not be any gap. Outside you go, you go in the marketplace, you go in the restaurant, there is no distancing. Why is there the distancing in the mosque? If you have distancing everywhere else and also in the mosque, accept it. But outside you go, distancing is not there, only in the mosque. So I agree with the first group of scholars say that there should not be distancing. Similarly, even in normal circumstances, when there is no pandemic, the first group of scholars say that there cannot be a second Jamaat, a Juma, second Juma, Salah in the same mosque. I agree with that first group of scholars. Even if there's lack of space, you can go out in the public, etc. In the public space or a garden. In the pandemic, again, the difference of opinion that can you have a second Juma in the pandemic? So the first group of scholars will say that that's not required. You should not have. But yet, majority of the scholars, because of the pandemic, because of the infection to prevent the disease from spreading, they will say that the second Jama, a Friday Jama in the same mosque is permitted. So the difference of opinion, especially because of the pandemic, there is a lot of things which never happened in the Muslim Ummah, in the history of Islam, and it's happening. So the opinion would be, uh, would be divided. Inshallah, Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will see to it that he sees your niya. That's important. But personally, if you ask me, I would agree with the first group of scholars that let there be only one Jama in the mosque. And if the lack of space, you have it open 
in the gardens, in the parks, see to the permission from your locality, that is preferable. Hope that answers the question. We have on the Facebook, Kumara Lansana. May God mighty Allah guide you and protect you. Kumara Lansana. Ahmed Abdul Halim Qasim. Isam Farg. Ashik Ali. Very good, sir. Muhammad Ahmed Raza. Love you, sir. I love you, too. Muhammad Noor Hidayat. Subhanallah. Dilawar Hussain. Amiru Ibrahim Yusuf, Mashallah, Allah Akbar. Hamidul Islam Abrar HM. Sami Opu. Nazmul Hassan, Assalamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salam. I am from Bangladesh, Mashallah. Asmat Khan Suleiman Ali. Nabard Shamarani. Zakir Belim. Zakir Allah Apko Kamiyap Kare, Amin. Wahid Ahmed, MashaAllah. Many are saying salams to me. I wish you walaikum salam. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give you the best in this world and the akhirah. We have on the YouTube, Ahmed Bilal, I love you, I love you too. Ruknuddin, Mazar, Afridi Talib, Kalim Sayyid Wasim. Fardin Khan, Ataur Rahman, Reni Nuraini, Mukibur Rahman, Sobia Khan, Yusuf, Mazar Afridi Talib, Saad Zubair, Haider Sheikh, Fardin Khan, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Salam. There's a question on the YouTube from Muhammad Miraj. According to you, what is the real reason for the persecution of Muslims all over the world? According to me, the real reason that the Muslims are persecuted is because, alhamdulillah, we Muslims are on the Tawheed. And we Muslims believe that Masha, there is only one God and we are believers of those who do good and we want the good to spread. We want peace to spread in the world. So the Muslims have been persecuted mainly by those people who do not want peace to prevail in the world. So what do they do? They create fabrication and they create atmosphere where they want to persecute the Muslims and we see this today in the world. It's happening in China where the Uyghur Muslims, they are being imprisoned in, in concentration camps. And according to human rights reports, there are about 2 million Muslim Chinese, the Uyghur Muslims. And in the name of education, in the name of giving them training, or in the name of curbing terrorism, they just want to persecute. Why? Because they are afraid of the spread of the deen. What we find in Myanmar, what do we find in Rohingya? Peace-loving people, but they are labeled as terrorists, they are attacked, and that's what's happening in India. In India, you find that the Hindus, now they want to attack the Muslims, and recently there was a gathering in, uh, in Haridwar of 
Hindu stalwarts openly saying, we will take arms and we'll kill the Muslims. We'll kill millions of Muslims. And nothing is happening. So these are mainly are being done because these people who are engineering this persecution are mainly those people who don't want peace to prevail in the world. Whether it be in Palestine, they don't want peace to prevail. Because, you know, Islam is a peace-loving religion. It's a religion which wants to spread peace. It's a religion that believes in Tawheed. So because Islam today is the fastest growing religion in the world, and today, alhamdulillah, more than 26% of the world population are Muslim. Every fourth human being you come across in this world today is a Muslim. It's the fastest growing religion. And inshallah, in a few decades, many countries would have Muslims as the majority. So they don't want the spread because if Islam spreads, then they'll have to follow peace. They'll have to believe in Tawheed. They'll have to believe that alcoholism is wrong. They'll have to believe that zina, that fornication, adultery is wrong. So all these wrong things which are happening, what the other non-Muslims enjoy, Islam forbids. So for that reason, they want any excuse to persecute the Muslim to prevent the Muslims from gaining large numbers. What we should do is we Muslims should unite together. Unfortunately, we Muslims are divided. If all the Muslims of the world unite, imagine today there are more than 2 billion Muslims. Out of the 7.8 billion human beings in the world, more than 2 billion are Muslims. Mashallah more than 26% of the human population are Muslims. If the Muslims are united, inshallah, will be a strong force. Unfortunately, we Muslims are united. If we Muslims are united and follow the words of the Quran that help each other in birr and taqwa, in righteousness and good deeds, inshallah, no one will be able to persecute the Muslims. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may the time come that the Muslims unite and they realize the scheme of the non-Muslims and they should stop the persecution of the Muslims in different parts of the world. Hope that answers the question. There's a question on the YouTube from Tafsir and Islamic Reminders. How do I prove to an agnostic or an atheist that Islam is the only true religion. This calls for a talk. You can very well watch my video, Does God Exist? And it will convince an atheist that exists in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you can see my video because it is the Quran God's word. Both these talks, if you hear inshallah, it will convince an atheist and an agnostic the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, if they watch with an unbiased mind, they will believe that Islam is the true religion. The next question from the Facebook, Nagina Asgar. According to you, which is the best tafsir of the Quran? As far as the tafsir or the tafasirs of the Quran are concerned, the best is the tafsir at Tabri and tafsir ibn Qasir. These two are the best tafsir. Tafsir At-Tabri was written by Imam Muhammad ibn Jarir At-Tabri. He was born in 224 Hijri and died in 310 Hijri. And according to Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, 
he says that he has not come across a better tafsir than at tabri But natural Ibn Qasir was it in later on. So what he was talking, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, was at his time. And this tafsir is excellent and unanimously, undoubtedly, it is the best tafsir. Along with tafsir of Ibn Qasir. The second tafsir, as I said, these two tafsir are considered the best tafsir. The second tafsir is tafsir Ibn Qasir, written by Al-Hafiz Abu Al-Fadl, Imam Uddin, Ismail, Ismail bin Umar bin Qatir. He died in 774 Hijri. This tafsir was written about 450 years after Tabri. These two are the best tafsir. But Ibn Qasir is a tafsir that gives the views of all various tafsir. So Ibn Qasir, what he did was he collected the views of various tafsirs, of the various, and they give the opinion. And then in the end, he may give his opinion, he may not give his opinion. But it, he has collected and does a lot of research of various tafsir that came before and include that. And then he may give his opinion whether right or wrong, he may not give. He may write his opinion, he may not write his opinion, but these two are the best of seed. Ibn Qasir is good for scholars as well as for students of knowledge. But a tabri is specifically meant for scholars. It's of a very high level. So these two tafasirs are the best tafasir, tafsir a tabri and tafsir Ibn Qasir. Then you have other tafsir in Arabic. Uh, tafsir Qurtubi, you have Tafsir al Jalalain, written by Jalalain al Mahali and Jalalain al Suyuti. Now, these two Jalalain are the two scholars who wrote this very good Tafsir. There are many in Arabic, but undoubtedly, At Tabri and Ibn Qasir are the best. Even Qurtubi is there, Jalalain, and various others. But since the question is asked in English, I believe you, are, you will be wanting to know which tafsir is best in English. Unfortunately, At-Tabri hasn't been translated into English, but Alhamdulillah Ibn Qasir has been translated into English language. So I would say that if you want to read a tafsir in English, the best would be the English translation of tafsir Ibn Qasir. There are quite a few publishers who have translated this, but the best I would recommend is the one published by Darus Salaam, whose headquarters is in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And what Darus Salaam did is that they did the research when, when Ibn Qasir gives the opinion of the various tafasir, which may not be right, which are based on Sahih Hadith, some opinions are based on Zaif Hadith. So Darus Salaam had a team of scholars under the supervision of Sheikh Mubarak Puri, under the supervision of Sheikh Safiuddin Mubarak Puri, who was also the author of The Seal Nectar, Raik al Maktoum, which got an award for the best biography of the Prophet. So, and a team of scholars. What they did, they went through this full tafsir in Arabic of Ibn Qasir and those opinions which are based on Zayf Hadith or which, not, or which are not correct, they removed it. And they printed an abridged version of Ibn Qasir. And Alhamdulillah, this is a great work. The abridged version is also in Arabic and then they translate into English. So I would recommend that if you have time, the best translation that you can read of a tafsir, the best would be Ibn Qasir in English, the abridged version by Darus Salaam. The second tafsir I would recommend is Tafsir Asadi, written by Sheikh Abdurrahman Ibn Nasir Asadi. This is also a very good tafsir, and again, the translation done by Darus Salaam is very good. So these two tafsir are the best, Ibn Qasir undoubtedly is the best, then would be Asadi. It's in good, simple English. The other tafsir which is available is the Noble Quran that is done by Sheikh Taqiyuddin Al-Hilali and Sheikh Mohsen Khan. 
There are other translations of the Quran. Among the translations of the Quran, I would recommend the best according to me is Abdul Aziz Ali. And Abdul Aziz Ali, along with translation, it also has commentary and footnotes. So you can say it is a sort of a tafsir, not as voluminous as Ibn Qasir or as Asadi, but it is medium. And Abdul Aziz Ali, mashallah, spent a great deal of time. He was good in Arabic and he spent a great deal of time in English is fabulous. It, every translation has a mistake and even Abdul Aziz Ali had a mistake. But many revisions have been done, umpteen number of revisions. What I would recommend is that if you read the revised edition of Abdul Aziz Ali, which has been done by Triple IT, that is the International Institute of Islamic Thought in Virginia, USA. So if you read the revised edition of Abdul Yusuf Ali done by Triple IT, that would be the best. It has got commentary, it has got footnotes, it can be called a sort of a tafsir. The others are by Abdul Majid Daryabadi, it's in four volume. It's mainly good for comparative religion. So Abdul Majid, if you read the, taf the tafsir in English or the translation along, along with the commentary and the footnotes by Abdul Majid Daryabadi, it deals quite a bit even on comparative religion. If you want a plain translation, a good English, simple English, I would recommend the Sai International. So this was in brief regarding the Tafasirs. For more details, you can refer to my video cassette on, on my talk on Al-Quran, should it be written, understanding where I have described in detail about the various Tafasirs and the translation of the Quran. But this in brief is, is the reply to your question. Hope that. There's another question on the YouTube by Sobia Khan. I never hit puberty. I never got married. I, I never hit puberty. I never got period. Can I marry? The question posed by the sister is that she never reached puberty. She never got a period. Can she marry? As far as marriage is concerned in Islam, to consummate the marriage, it's a requirement that that the girl should reach puberty. And this is the view of many scholars, including Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. But there are, there are possibilities that you can arrange the marriage. The marriage can be arranged before puberty. But as far as consummation is concerned, according to scholars, the correct opinion, even according to Ibn Taymiyyah, Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, is that the consummation of the marriage should only take place after she reaches puberty. Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah also believes that unnecessarily even marrying without consummation before puberty, he wasn't in that favor. But if a marriage takes place, after the girl reaches puberty, she has a right to cancel that marriage according to Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. But the general concept of Islam is for the consummation of the marriage to take place, the girl should reach puberty. Hope that answers the question. Uh, the next question by Sayyid Abdul Rahman, Manchester, UK. Assalamu alaikum, Zakir Sahib, and everyone in the organization. Why is pork haram? A similar question is asked by Naimur Rahman. I am a student from Magura, Bangladesh. Why is it forbidden to eat pork in Islam? The question asked is, why is it forbidden to eat pork in Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in no less than four different places. In Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 173. In Surah Maida chapter number 5, verse number 3. In Surah Anam chapter number 6, verse number 145. And Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 115, Allah says, 
حرمت علیکم المیت تو ودم ولا ملکن فی وما الا لجر الله بی فبرین فور یو فور فودا دیڈ میٹ بلڈ دی فلیش اف سوائن اینڈ اینی فود اون وچ اینی نیم بیسائیڈز اللہ نیم اس ٹیکن سو نو لیس دین فور ڈیفرنٹ پلیس ان دی قران ایٹ از کلیئرلی منشن دیٹ دیڈ میٹ بلڈ دی فلیش اف سوائن دیٹ از پوک اینڈ اینی فود اون وچ اینی نیم بیسائیڈز اللہ نیم اس ٹیکن ایٹ از پرائیویٹڈ So anyone who's a Muslim, who believes in the Quran, he will abstain from eating pork. Pork is also prohibited in the Bible. It is mentioned in the Bible in no less than three different places. It's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. It says that the swine, though he divides the hoof and has cloven foot yet it chews not the cud he is unclean for you of their flesh he shall eat not of their carcass you shall touch not they are unclean for you a similar message is given in the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 14 verse number 8 where it says the swine though it divides the hoof yet it chews not the cud it is unclean for you you shall not eat the flesh you shall not touch the dead carcass you shall not touch the dead carcass it is unclean for you the similar message that pork is prohibited is also repeated in the book of isaiah chapter number 65 verse number 2 to 5 so no less than three places the bible prohibits the christians from having pork similarly even in the hindu scriptures it says in the Vishnu Shitra, chapter number 24, verse number 1, that you shall not sell the flesh of swine. So selling pork is prohibited. Now let's analyze the person. He may not be religious, he may not follow the Bible, he may be a Christian, but yet, or he may be atheist. So how do we convince an atheist or a non-Muslim who does not believe in religious scriptures that pork is prohibited? Today science tells us that if a person has pork, there are chances that the person can have 70 different types of diseases. There are various helminths that a person can have if he eats pork. He can have roundworm, he can have pinworm, he can have hookworm. And one of the dangerous helminths that a person can have if he has pork is called as tinea solium. In layman's terminology, it is called a tapeworm. It harbors in the intestine, it's very long. And the ova, the egg, via the bloodstream, if it goes to the brain, it can cause memory loss. If it goes to the eye, it can cause blindness. If it enters the heart, it can cause heart attack. If it enters the liver, it can cause liver damage. It can enter almost all the organs of the body. And by the time you realize it, it's too late. It is very dangerous. The other dangerous Helminth is, is Trichura Trichurasis. And many people have a misconception that if you cook the pork very well, you will not have these diseases. In fact, there was a research in America that out of the 24 people who were suffering from Trichura Trichurasis, 22 had cooked the food very well. That means cooking your food in normal temperature that you can gain in home in the normal cooking facility it doesn't kill the helminths or the germs that are there in the pork fourthly today science tells us that the pork has very little muscle building material it has more fat and people who have pork you find there are fat deposits on the vessels which lead to atherosclerosis which causes hypertension which also causes heart attack furthermore we know today that the pig is one of the most filthiest animal and you find the pig normally is there where there is dirt and muck and filth you know in the villages where we don't have modern toilets like the way we have People normally go for the call of nature in the open air, you know, where they go for 
for defecation is open air. And you find very often the pig comes and cleans up all this. It's a scavenger. It's on its own reason. There may be some people who argue that, okay, this may be in the poor country that the pig is dirty. But if you go to the advanced country like Australia, they are kept in hygienic places, they are kept in Thai. But even in Australia, there is not one pig kept alone in a sty. There are few pigs put together. And today science tells us, we know that the pig eats the excreta of the other pigs. It even eats its own excreta. Imagine. It thrives on that. You don't have a person 24 hours manning the sty that whenever the pig defecates, they pick it up. No. So even in the most hygienic country like Australia, the pig eats its own excreta and the excreta of its friend. And I would like to add one more point, that today science tells us that pig is one of the most shameless animal on the face of the earth. It is the only animal that invites its friends to have sex with its mate. That means the pig invites its friends and enjoys seeing his mate having sex with a friend. And today what do we see in the western country? It's very common in America that they have dance parties. At the end of the dance parties, you are swapping of wives. You sleep with my wife, I sleep with your wife. Is this good? And the answer is no. The next question. My name is Abdul Rahman. I'm from Pakistan. How do we reply to a non-Muslim who says that when Islam is against idol worship, then why do the Muslims worship and bow down to the Kaaba while they are praying? The idol that is worshipped maximum in the world is the Kaaba. Regarding replying to the allegation laid by the non-Muslims, that if Islam is against idol worship, then why do the Muslims bow down and worship the Kaaba? Isn't Kaaba the idol which is worshipped the most in the world? Let me tell you at the outset that no Muslim ever bows and worships to the Kaaba. No Muslim worships the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Qibla. It is the direction. And in Salah, we pray in the direction of the Kaaba, but we bow and worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 144 that faith in the direction of the sacred mosque. So it's a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you are praying, you should pray in the direction of the sacred mosque, the Kaaba. So that's the requirement. And we Muslims, when we pray, we believe in unity. For example, if we have to pray here, and if there are many Muslims, some Muslims will say, Let's pray, let's face the north while praying. Some will say, let's face the south while praying. Some will say east, some will say west. Where do we face? So for unity, the Quran has said that when we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we face in the direction of the sacred mosque. Our Qibla is the Kaaba. So those people who are living on the west of the Kaaba, they will face towards the east. Those who are living on the east of the Kaaba, they will face towards the west. Those who live on the north, in the north of the Kaaba, they will face towards the south. Those which live on the south will face the north. So, for unity, so we pray together in congregation and we face in the direction of the Kaaba for unity. And we worship no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that the Muslim cartographers were the first who created and drew the world map. And when the Muslims do the world map, it was in Al-Idrusi in 1154, was the first person who drew the world map. And we know that when the Muslims drew the world map, they had the South Pole on the top, the North Pole down, and the Kaaba was in the center. The Western cartographers came later on and they turned the map upside down. They put the North Pole on top, South Pole down, but yet, Alhamdulillah, the Kaaba is yet in the center. When we Muslims go to Makkah during Umrah and during Hajj, we do Tawaf. 
we circumambulate around the Kaaba. Why do we circumambulate? We don't circumambulate around the Kaaba because we worship it. This is because it is the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Circumambulate around the Kaaba and we circumambulate it. And logically, if I have to think, we all know that every circle has got one center. So we're circumambulating around the Kaaba to testify that there is only one Allah. There is only one God. That is the reason for Tawheed. And the statement of Umar an, the second caliph of Islam, is sufficient to answer this question. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, hadith number 1597, hadith number 1597, that Umar an, the second caliph of Islam, he looks at Hajj Aswad, the black stone, and he says that you black stone can neither benefit me nor can you harm me. Just because I've seen the Prophet touch it and kiss it, I am touching and kissing it. So this statement of the second caliph of Islam, Umar an, saying that the black stone can neither benefit me, cannot harm me, I am only touching and kissing it because I've seen the Prophet touch it and kiss it. It's sufficient to prove that the Muslims don't worship the Hajj Aswad, we don't worship the Kaaba. And I would like to mention one more point. That during the time of the Prophet, there were Sahabas who stood on the Kaaba and gave the Azan. I am asking a question, will any idol worshipper stand on the idol he or she worships? And the answer is no. So the Muslims at the time of the Prophet stood on the Kaaba and gave the Adhan. And it's mentioned in the Hadith. Even Hadith Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him. So this is sufficient proof that the Muslims, they don't worship the Kaaba. The Kaaba is only the Qibla. Hope that's the question. Next question, that's from the WhatsApp. Mausam Parveen, I am a student from Kolkata, India. Now in India, I am not allowed to wear hijab in exams like CSIR, NET, GATE, etc. Is it permissible to take off hijab during exam where men are present in the examination hall? The sister asked the question from Calcutta that nowadays she is not allowed to wear hijab in certain examination of gate, of, of CSIR, of net. And I'm aware that lately in the last few years, since the new government came to power, that is the BJP, there has been animosity against the Muslim. Otherwise, as far as the Indian constitution is concerned, every citizen of India has the right to preach, practice and propagate his religion. So if a Muslima is wearing a hijab and she goes to a college, no one can take off the hijab. But I'm aware there have been incidences in certain parts of India where the supervisor has asked the Muslim girl that you cannot enter the examination hall with your hijab. And Alhamdulillah, there were few incidences and all of them, all the Muslim that I read article, they refused and they did not give the exam and they went back. But this is not allowed according to the constitution. I'm sure if all the Muslims get together and if they hire a good lawyer and surely by the Indian constitution no one can prevent you from wearing the hijab during the examination, you should do that. But the basic question, can you remove the hijab for preparing for an examination if they force you to? No, you cannot. Wearing hijab for a Muslima in front of the mehram is a fard. She has to wear. She cannot say that I will remove because it's an examination. If they force you, it is better you don't sit for the examination because you cannot do a haram thing and sit 
wearing hijab for a muslima a fard allah says in the quran in surah nur chapter number 24 verse number 31 say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of and to see to it that they draw the head covering over the bosom except in front of her husband her father her son and a big list of mehram is given so the answer is that even for an examination you cannot remove your hijab you sweet it you convince the management that it's a fard for you to wear and inshallah they'll allow as a last sort if they don't allow then you should not sit for the examination because that's not permitted for you to remove your hijab in front of the other males hope that answers the question The next question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik. Wa alaikum assalam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Arsh Ahmed from Agra, India. I am a student currently preparing for medical entrance examination. I always wanted to become a doctor since childhood, but from 2016 onwards, I started hearing your lectures on YouTube. And I learned many things about Islam and comparative religion. And started conveying the message of Islam to my family and friends. So much so that certain people started calling me by your name, Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. And my Hindu friends started asking questions about Islam. And started getting afraid of me as I started quoting many things from the religious books. Observing these things, I started thinking that I can also become a full-time Dai like you. But my mother says to me that first I should become a doctor, get settled, and then think of becoming a full-time Dai. What should I do in this manner? What should I do in this matter? Should I become a doctor first or give up my dream, become give up my dream of becoming a doctor and head towards the path of becoming a full-time Dai? Also, what should be the steps of becoming a full-time Dai like you? Kindly guide me in this situation. Jazakallah khair. Buddha Arsh has asked a question that he is about to appear for his medical entrance exam. But he is very active in the field of, of Dawa. And he sees many of my video cassettes. And after he sees my video cassette, he memorizes them. And he started speaking with Muslims as well as non-Muslims. And Alhamdulillah, he has been able to convince many of them, so much so that they started calling him Dr. Zakir Naik. And that's good, Alhamdulillah, I'm proud of it. But his dream was to become a doctor. Now he found this and he wants to become a full-time guy. And his mother is saying, first you complete your medical studies, become a doctor, and then you become a full-time guy. He wants my advice. If a person wants to be a full-time Dai, then but natural, he should spend his time in trying to learn and trying to gain information on the Deen and on comparative religion so that this can be conveyed. What we have to realize is that if you wanted to become a doctor, it was a dream. But now you want to become a full-time guy. So should you complete, and your mother is saying complete, become a medi medical doctor, settle, and then you become a full-time guy. Imagine to become a medical doctor, you have to spend four and a half years in the college, and then one year internship, five and a half years. It is a great deal of time. In my case, it was different. I was in the medical college. I met Sheikh Didat when, when I was in the second year of the medical college and I got more and more involved. But by, time, by the time I got involved, I had already finished medical studies. And we started the organization when I was doing internship. And my father is a doctor, my brother is a doctor. So I told my parents that, you know, now it's the internship, so maybe I will give whatever time I have. But once later on, I want to do my post-graduation in surgery. So when you're doing a post-graduation, I could hardly give maybe two hours a week. 
So with that intention we started. But by the time I finished internship, you know, I have to give half the time for internship, half the time for Dawa in the organization. I spoke to my parents and I said that I don't want to further study. I want to be 50% time die and they agreed. Then I got involved in setting up the diagnostic center. My brother was a doctor, my father was a doctor. And then I requested my parents that can I give only two hours for medicine daily and the balance time for Dawa and they agreed. Later on, after a few months, I said I want to become 100% full-time die, and they did not mind and they supported me. In your case, you are going to sit for a medical entrance exam. And to finish medical minimum four and a half years, one year internship, it is five and a half years. It's five and a half precious years. So if you have decided, my dream also was, and my mother's dream was, that I become a heart specialist. And she wanted me to become like Dr. Chris Bernard who was the first surgeon who transplanted a heart from one human being to the other human being. He comes from South Africa. And even the person who inspired me, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Didal, he too comes from South Africa. So I asked my mother that, do you want me to become like Sheikh Ahmed Didal or Dr. Chris Bernard? And she, being smart, being my mother, she said both. And so I used to spend first equal time in medical practice and dawa, then became two hours for medical practice, remaining for dawa, then within a few years, I asked to give full time for dawa and my parents were very happy. And when I started giving lectures and having debates and became, people started hearing my videos, then I asked the same question to my mother again. Do you want me to become like Sheikh Ahmed Didad or Dr. Chris Bernard? So she replied that I can sacrifice a thousand Dr. Chris Bernard for one Shaykh Didad. And that's how, mashallah, I was inspired by Shaykh Ahmad Didad and I became full-time Dai. Now coming back to your question, that you, it was your dream to become a doctor. But now you realize that becoming a Dai is more important. So if you realize that your dream was good, but now you found a better a better profession, that's for thy, as Allah says in the Quran, sorry, Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 30, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ دَعِيلَ اللَّهِ وَأَمِلُ الصَّالِحَوْمْ وَقَالَ إِنَّ لِمِلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says, I'm a Muslim. So the best profession according to the Quran is that of thy. So if you want to become a dai, why should you waste your time studying five and a half years for medicine? Yes, in my case it was different. I was a normal practicing Muslim. I was doing my medicine and then I was inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didal. But by the time I was inspired, I had already finished my medical. Yes, what I did, I did not go for my post-graduation because I was involved in the field of dawah. So now your mother, if she's asking you and telling you that finish your medical practice and then do what you want to do, I'm sorry. I disagree with her. Maybe she's thinking, oh, Dr. Zakir Naik is popular because he's a medical doctor, so you also become a doctor. This is a fallacy. Now, many people say, okay, because Dr. Zakir is a medical doctor, even I will become a medical doctor and then I will do dawa. I never want my son to do medicine. Why should I waste my son five and a half years? What he wants to learn about medicine, I can teach him in just two, three months. What part of medicine is required for dawa, I can teach him in two, three months. Why should he spend five and a half? Yes. So according to me, I would request you that if you have decided to become a full-time Dai, the best would be that you look for a job which will be sufficient for your, for your living and, and see to it that you become a full-time Dai. Now, when you're becoming a full-time Dai, people have misconception that, okay, if you're a doctor, more people will listen to you. That's only at a lower level. Suppose the layman gives the lecture, maybe 10 people will come. And if you see a medical doctor who has got MBBS or MD is giving a lecture, then maybe 20 will come. So this is good if you want to become a low-level Dai, good. But once you go to the international level, if you go on a mass level, that time no one sees your degree. They see your ability. You know, Sheikh Ahmed Didad, he's only 
past six standard he is not even a graduate he is not even past high school he didn't even pass school only six standard but he challenged the stalwarts of christianity so here you cannot say oh sheikh did that only six standard pass yet because of his ability so it is wrong to say that if you do medicine you will be better you do better than i disagree and what is required for you to know in the medicine field for doing dawa you can learn in few months do not have to spend five and a half years on that so my advice to you brother would be that if you have decided to become a full time dai i would say that see to it that you start immediately you can enroll in a college maybe of sharia or of fiqh depending on your field of interest see to it that you join and you do your bachelor's in the islamic study whether it be sharia whether it be fiqh whether it be tafsir whether it be hadith whichever language you feel is the best you can do and at the same time do dawa and you have to excel in the field of dawa i would not recommend you to become a doctor at all because allah gave you mashallah hidayah much before in my case i had already finished i was in the second year finished third year when got involved so if you would have been in the third year i would have said complete or okay, spend one one more in complete you have not even got admission yet so i would advise that you convince your mother saying that you know this is a better profession as allah says surah maida chapter number uh, it said in surah fusil chapter number 41 verse number 33 that the, the best is the person who invites to the way of the lord and inshallah inshallah you will be able to convince your mother so my advice to you would be to get involved in the field of dawa immediately you can join you can join islamic organization or you can do your research and see to it that you give talks to the non muslim and i would recommend that you immediately if you have decided to go in the field of dawa you start getting involved in dawa activity and you need not do your medicine hope that answers the question next question from siddharth from durban south africa hi hope you are well yes i am if a woman is dressed appropriately islamically and is modeling jewelry would that still be haram or acceptable so the siddharth has asked a question that if a muslim woman is modeling and she is wearing appropriate clothes she will be modeling for jewelry so will that be haram apart from islam as far as modeling is concerned modeling for a woman is prohibited you know where they have cameras and it will be shown on the television or shown on the movies or so modeling is prohibited for a woman i am talking about general modeling and if you are saying that if she is dressed up properly and can she do modeling of jewelry Now the Quran is very clear cut in Surah Nur, chapter number twenty-four, verse number thirty-one. Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not her beauty and ornaments unless that which is required of, and to draw the veil over over her bosom, and the verse continues except in front of of the marriage, the, the husband, the father, the son, and a big list of marriage is given. So here, what we understand is. that modeling person in islam it is showing off your body showing off so this is against the hijab you cannot say i am wearing hijab and doing modeling the whole concept of hijab is to be modest unless there is exception that if the woman is doing modeling exclusively to women audience and if there are no cameras and there are and there are no recording and if she is doing modeling exclusively in front of women and then she is wearing jewelry it's acceptable she is dressed up properly and she is modeling only among women and if there no gents it's acceptable 
But generally, doing shooting and coming in ads, etc., it's prohibited because that ad will be seen by male and female, by Muslim and non-Muslim, whether it be a video recording, whether it be a photograph. So, it is prohibited for a woman to do modeling unless it's exclusively only amongst the women that's permitted because Quran is very clear cut in Surah Nur chapter 24 verse number 31 towards the end of the verse it says that do not bang your feet so that the hidden ornaments can be heard so this is not permitted hope that answers the question The next question, I am Tanbeen Firoz from Chattagram, Bangladesh, from Chattogram, Bangladesh. What is the significance of living a simple life rather than living a luxurious life? As far as the significance as far as the significance of living a simple life as compared to luxurious life is, it is subjective. What is luxury for one person may be simple for the other. What is simple for one person may be luxury for the other. For example, like if you go to villages in India and if you have an air condition, it is luxury. But if you go to Dubai, the air condition is a necessity. Even in the prison, you have good air condition. So that's a necessity, but in the village of India, it's a luxury. So what luxury for one may be necessity to the other. But the basic rule should be followed that if you're leading a luxurious life, you should see to it that you do not commit any haram activity. You should not break any rule of the Islamic Sharia. For example, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34, as to those who hold their wealth and spend it not in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah on the day of judgment will take that gold and would heat it in the hellfire and brand it on the forehead, on the back and Allah will say that have a taste of the wealth which he hoarded. So holding wealth is prohibited. But if a person is giving the cup, is giving his, due, giving his charity, then it is fine. So with or with a simple life and a luxurious life, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that it is easier for a poor man to go to Jannah than a rich man because the rich man will be questioned. All the wealth that Allah gave, what did you do of it? Did you spend it correctly? Did you spend it wrongly? And Allah is very clear cut in Surah Isra, chapter number 7, verse number 27 that do not be a spendthrift for verily a spendthrift is the brother of the devil so being a spendthrift is prohibited so if you ask me between the two leading a simple life is better than leading a luxurious life but natural that does not mean that you should be stingy as Allah says in the Quran that the Imad al Rahman are those people who are generous at the same time, they are not extravagant. That means they don't do extravagant. At the same time, they are generous. So, if you consider this, a simple life is much more easier because Allah will question you less. If you lead a luxurious life and you don't do anything haram, it is permitted. But the mustab is that Allah gave you the wealth and yet you led the simple life. That extra wealth, you can help the poor people, you can help your neighbors, you can help your friends. So, as far as between the two is concerned, a simple life or luxury life, but natural, a simple life is the best. And many times that you find that Life should be simple. The more simple it is, the more easier for you to speak the truth. Because once you're used to luxury and you have that, then there'll be high chances that 
for that luxury you 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 may try and bend here and there so the best is to lead a life which is simple and pure inshallah it's better than living a luxurious life there are high chances that you shall go to jannah hope that answers the question There's a question asked on the YouTube by Chavi Singh. Assalamu alaikum sir. Walaikum salam. I am Laiba from Delhi, India. I reverted to Islam a few months ago. And my parents don't know about this. How should I convince them to accept me as a Muslim? Chavi Singh has asked a question that she recently accepted Islam a few months ago, but the parents don't know. How will she make her parents accept her as a Muslim? The number one criteria is that Islam tells that you have to be good to your parents, and especially the mothers. And there are various verses. Surah Luqman chapter 31, verse number 14. Or sorry, Akhaf chapter 46, verse number 15, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to their parents. In travel upon travel did the mother bore them, in years twain was their meaning. Allah also says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, that we have enjoined on the human beings that you worship none but Allah, and that you be kind to your parents. And if one of them, or both of them, reach old age, don't say a word of contempt, but rather live with them with compassion and pray to the Lord that bless them as they cherish me childhood. So in Islam, you have to love and respect your parent, especially your mother. So now that you've become a Muslim, what you should do? You should start loving your parent more. So what you should love before, you have to love more. If previously you used to try and make her happy, now you have to make her more happy. Maybe previously you used to do half an hour work with her, now you have to do double or triple. You should see to it that there should be a change. You love her more and respect her more. Maybe she used to tell you something which you didn't like. She used to tell you to wear a yellow dress and you didn't like it. Now you wear it because wearing yellow is not haram. So try, there should be a marked difference between you what you were before and what you are now. She should start thinking, why has my daughter become so good? And then you can tell, because these are the teachings of Islam, that you have to love your parents, you have to respect your parents and take care of them. Uh, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mother. So, what you should do is you should see to it that there is a marked difference between your behavior before and now. So much so that they should ask you why, what has happened to you. And then you can reveal that I'm a Muslim and in Islam I have to love my parents, I have to respect my parents, I have to take care of them. So once you start taking care of them, they will realize, ah, my daughter has changed. She never used to help me before, now she's helping me. She never used to care about me, now she's caring more. So there should be a marked difference. And if you do this, inshallah, not only they will not object to you becoming a Muslim, inshallah, even they will become Muslims. And you are the zariah. You are the only way that you can guide them to the straight path. Because you are the child. So in this way you should see to it that you try and convince them with hikmah and see to it that even, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that may your parents also accept Islam inshallah. Amen. Inshallah, this would uh, be the last question before we end the session. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Qasim Haqmi. I am from Hirat, Afghanistan. 
Dear doctor, I love you a lot. I love you too. My question is, what is the ending of Isha Salah? And is it correct that any prayer can be done until an, another one time starts except Fajr Salah? The basic question asked is, The question asked by Qasim is that what is the time that Isha can be prayed? Can it be prayed up to Fajr? Because asked me the question that isn't Salah valid till the end time is till the next Salah starts except Fajr. As far as the time for Isha Salah is concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that Isha can be offered till Nisful Lail. Nisful Lail is midnight. So the right ruling is that Isha should be followed, can be prayed till midnight. And which point is the midnight? The night in Islam starts from Maghrib time. The moment the sun sets, the night starts. So from the sunset till the dawn, till the time for Fajr Salah, that is night. So from these two points, you take the midpoint, that is the time you can offer offer your Isha Salah. People think 12 o'clock midnight, no 12 o'clock is the midnight according to the solar calendar, but according to Islam, the night starts after sunset till dawn. So to know the midpoint, you have to check in your area, in your city, what time, what time is sunset till the time of dawn and divide by, add up and divide by two, that is the midpoint. Because the midnight may not be at 12 o'clock and normally you have a time zone like India is a big country you have got you know the time at the center of the country is the time which is there throughout the country those places or cities which are on the east when you say midnight it is midnight at 12 o'clock 12 o'clock in the center of the country but in east it will be much more earlier, it is past midnight. Midnight would be much more earlier before 12 o'clock. And those cities which are on the west, the midnight would be later after 12 o'clock. So 12 o'clock is not the right time for the ending of Isha. It is the midpoint from the sunset Maghrib time till the start of Fajr dawn time. This is right to me. There are some schools of thought the Hanafi school of thought, we say that it is better to pray before this full Lail, but if you pray after this full Lail, it is, though makru, it is permitted. But the right ruling is that according to the Hadith of Sai Muslim, our Prophet said, the Isha Salah is to this full Lail, till midnight. So, in two Salahs are not up to the, so besides Faj Isha, and Fajr. The Isha time doesn't end at the start of Fajr Salah, it ends at midnight. And the Fajr Salah also ends before the sun rises. It doesn't end at the time of Dhuar Salah. The remaining three Salah, Zohar, the remaining three Salah, Zohar, Asar and Maghrib, yes, Dhuar ends just before the start of Asar. And Asar time ends just before the start of start of Maghrib and Maghrib time ends just before the start of Isha. So the, these three Salah, yes, it is correct that the time of Salah is there till the start of the next Salah but as far as Isha is concerned and Fajr is concerned this is not there. Fajr ends before the sunrise and Isha ends at this full light that is midnight. Hope this answers the question and this is all the time that we had that we could take questions today. Till we inshallah meet two weeks from now, that is on the 15th of December. Till then, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa akhru dawan alhamdulillah.